Okay, welcome everybody. Um, we are turning the corner here to where this weekend we'll be celebrating Palm Sunday and Passion Sunday. That's always kind of a big, big chunk uh, of territory to cover in one service. If we all lived in a small village and the church was in the middle of the village, then this Sunday would be Palm Sunday. And then you would walk over to the church throughout the week. For all the passion stuff but we can't get people to walk over to the church throughout the week right now and so we try to do it all in one weekend saturday and sunday we cover palm sunday at the beginning of the service and then at some point in the service we turn to the passion story passion being the the word for suffering um so that's how the the story of jesus suffering is described so that's a lot. That's a lot of territory to cover. And I did make the decision that I would spend Monday's video focusing on the Palm Sunday story, the, the entry into Jerusalem, and then stay chapter 14 for today. I think trying to cover chapters 14 and 15 would be too much for one hour. Um, but we'll start by circling back to the 11th chapter and just I want to know from you, do you have any questions about the video or the text about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem? Let's start there. Do you have any questions coming in? <clears throat> it's all right. None of you watch the video. No, That's fine. You. That's just fine. No, um, I remember from... from last year or the year before that you talked about uh, it was possible that there was a pomp and circumstance entry by a, a different gate. Correct. That, that Jesus coming in on the front of the gate they did. Right. And that, that it was possible that, that Jesus' entry was sarcastic. Or, Correct. Okay. And you didn't cover that again didn't mention that this time. So I wonder if that was a, such a, a much lesser potential interpretation. Yeah, so there, there are a couple of things at play here. Um, Mary Beth Dinkler and um, uh, Leander, Hans Leander, both have shown that it was a fairly common thing in the Roman Empire that when a city was defeated, the, the 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 triumphal uh, general or emperor would enter the city. And I put on your handout the, the kind of three steps that were typical there. The prominent person was greeted and hailed, often as a divine revelation by the citizenry, citizenry near the gate. Um, and... Uh, this is from Leander's work. He says they're all male. They're then formally escorted into the city, accompanied by hymns and or acclamation. So that sounds exactly like our story so far. Um, but look at number three. The procession typically ends in the temple where some kind of ritual takes place, either a benevolent sacrifice or a hostile expulsion of some kind. The hostile expulsion would be the former king, something like that. You know, they would get rid of them. Um, Mary, uh, Michael Beth Dinkler's list is very similar, not quite the same. Um, so it does seem that that was something that on the occasion of taking a city, the, um, the, the Romans would practice. Borg and Cross argue that Pontius Pilate would reenact this every year coming into Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And so whereas Jesus has been coming down from Galilee and entering Jerusalem by the Mount of Olives, typically this time of year, Pilate would be on the coast at uh, one of the places there, um, um, probably Sephora. And uh, and would enter by a different gate, not necessarily the opposite gate, but a different gate, and would reenact this. So it, it really sparks the imagination 
that if that's pilots habit of reenacting their triumphal Roman entry into Jerusalem, that this really could be a parody, the whole thing. Um, I gave you the title of, a, of an article here. It's horrible, just a horrible title with Homi Bahaba as a Jerusalem city gates, post-colonial reading of the triumphal entry. You can tell it's an academic. Um, they've got a colon and everything. So, you know, it's an academic art. Um, but uh, he makes a, the, the name Homi Bahabaha, I, Bahabaha, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name. Um, he's an Indian writer who has done a lot of work on imitative mimicry. So you mimic something, you imitate it. That can be done uh, joyfully and respectfully. <laughs> um, a civil war reenactment, for example, you know, is uh, people like to just kind of relive history like that, right? So it's mimicry. Uh, but the word mimic sometimes has a negative connotation. It could become mockery as well. And the way you do that, uh, Baha Baha argues, is that um, you make it like, but not quite like, the thing you're going to parody. So it's like it, but not quite like it. There's a little bit of difference. Um, you know, it's Abraham Lincoln saying, cool, <laughs> you know, in the middle of a show. And now, you know, this isn't meant as serious historical drama. This is, you know, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure or something like that, right? Uh, so it's very much like, but not quite like. And his argument, Hans Leander's argument, is that this is what Jesus is doing. And Morgan Crossan say he's trying to be like, but not like Pontius Pilate. So it becomes, parody then becomes a, a means of resistance. Um Sarcasm and parody are very effective tools against hubris. That's what that's what they're effective. They can be mean and unkind, but they also can be very effective against hubris. When someone's making too big of a deal out of themselves, parody is a way of trying to take the wind out of that sail. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think Borden Crossan have a really smart thing going there that uh, so you have Jesus, and instead of riding on a mighty steed, a war horse of some sort, he's riding on a colt that's never been ridden. And um, instead of being led by um, uh, a military in their fine garments and so forth, he's being led by a crowd throwing clothes on the street. And um, you know, and and even the word Hosanna, I didn't know until this year that there's some question. I've always read that nobody knows exactly what it means. And um, it is a Hebrewism, but it's kind of hard to tell what exactly the connection to a Hebrew word is. The best I've read is that maybe perhaps it means save us. That makes sense. Um, but one of the commentators that Leander points to says maybe it's also intended to be a mispronunciation, a misapprehension of a Hebrew word. That So that would be parodying not only the Roman Empire, but also the hubris of the Jewish leadership. It's almost, but not quite, the word you say in worship. Isn't that funny? Because uh, I mean, it doesn't show up anywhere else, really. It's not really a common word, it's not hallelujah. Uh, which is what we would expect. Um, so just kind of, um, it does seem like the potential that this is all parody is really interesting. Um, and parody also is very subversive. So it's not, it's not just fun and games. It's also rather dangerous. And we know that as readers because Jesus has told us he's going into Jerusalem for the express purpose of dying. So. Any other uh, questions about uh, the 11th chapter, the book or the video? 
Okay. Um, and welcome, Beryl. Good to see you. Glad to have you tuning in. Um, let's let's look. Let's fast forward to Mark chapter fourteen. Okay. What has happened so far is that um, Jesus has gone back to the temple. He's had some very uh, sharp conversation with the the religious leadership there. They've tried to trap him. They take turns. <laughs> Pharisees ask him a question. He parries that. Um, the uh, Sadducees try to trick him with a question, and he he overcomes that. Um, it, it, it just seems like they all take turns trying to get Jesus to say something seditious or um, heretical. And he just keeps smartly kind of biting that off. But then in Mark 13, um, that's when Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives, which is over and against the temple. That's an interesting term. Um, and one of the disciples says, wow, would you look at that building? Because uh, it really was a magnificent building. And that's when Jesus says, uh, the time is coming when not one stone will be left upon another. And so the 13th chapter of Mark's gospel gets really dark in terms of the days that are coming and how foreboding they will be. And that's one reason why most scholars feel that Mark's gospel was written at or around the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, because Jesus is just really naming a lot of the issues and tragedies that are going to be happening there. Um, Others say that's not necessarily the case. Jesus just saw the future and was telling them what was going to happen. Um, that too is a possibility. <clears throat> and then you get to this 14th chapter. There are some really, really key stories here. And I just, I want to walk through all of them and spend a little time with them just to show you some kind of interesting dynamics there. Okay. So the first 11 verses of chapter 14. Um, it begins with a plot to kill Jesus, and then that is followed by a story of a woman who washes Jesus' feet, or, or anoints Jesus' head, I'm sorry, uh, anoints Jesus' head with a very costly ointment. And then that's followed by Judas going and agreeing to betray Jesus and getting paid a good sum of money, okay? Now, this is a very familiar technique that Mark uses that we've seen in a number of cases. It's a bracketing technique. The plot to kill Jesus and then the betrayal gets agreed on and the price. That's actually one story. And what Mark does fairly often, he'll take one story, break it open, and put another story in between. That's what I call the bracketing uh, method. It's called sandwiching also. Um, we've seen it before in Mark's gospel. Jesus curses the fig tree. He cleanses the temple. He comes back and the fig tree is dead. So what's the problem with the fig tree? That's the problem with the temple. You see, so when Mark tells the story that way, the two, the two stories that are interwoven and in that sandwich are meant to help interpret one another. So we have the story um, of betrayal. And uh, it, it implicates the chief priests and the Pharisees and Judas. That's the first story that makes up the bread of the sandwich, as it were. And the peanut butter on the inside is a story of a woman who does the exact opposite. She's not the chief priest. She doesn't have an office. She doesn't have a name. She's not Judas. Jesus says, um, whenever the gospel is told, what she has done will be remembered. But her name is not. She's never named uh, in this story. And um, But she does the right thing. She's the only, only disciple in Mark's gospel who has accepted Jesus' death. She anoints him with uh, ointment. And he said that she has anointed me for my death. Everybody else has denied his death. Except for her, well, and Judas. 
and Judas is complicit in it. So what we get in this bracketing technique is uh, two stories of contrast between a disciple that failed in, in one respect by betraying Jesus and agreeing to do that, and a dis unnamed disciple who is a woman who is the only one to accept that Jesus is going to die and prepares him for his death. Isn't that fascinating? Mm -hmm. So it's not just not just that each of these stories is compelling in itself. The the, the sandwich <laughs> that Mark has put together itself is, is really a fascinating way of telling story. Okay, any questions about the first um, 11 verses? Once you get once you get aware that Mark does this graphics, then then I think you can start seeing other places where he breaks stories apart and puts another story in there. All right. Now look at verses 12 through 16. And this is the Passover. Um, this is the preparation for the Passover. So you remember back in chapter 11 with the triumphal entry, as we call it, the entry into Jerusalem, Jesus sent two disciples to go and fetch the colt, right? And he told them, <clears throat> two disciples, go do this. You'll see that. Someone will ask you this, and then you'll get that and bring it back. All right. Look what happens here. In verse 12, um, the disciples asked Jesus, where do you want us to make preparation for you to eat the Passover? He sends two disciples. Go to the city. You'll see a man carrying a jar of water. Uh, he will meet you. Follow him, and whenever wherever he enters, say to them, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I can celebrate with my disciples, right? Um, so much like the previous story. Uh, in the previous story, if anyone asks you why you're taking the cult, tell them the Lord has need of it. Here, you follow the man with the jar. <laughs> he takes you into a house. You tell the person at the house, where's the, where's the room for the teacher? And uh, and then he'll show you a room that's furnished, and you prepare for the Passover meal there. It's just really um, so. There are two ways of thinking about this, and you've heard me say this many times. And if you and you are sitting there anticipating what I'm getting ready to say, we have accomplished much. Um, there are two ways of interpreting this one. One is the way with which I don't agree. So I call it magic Jesus. And what I should do is say, one option is this. Um, and that is that, that Jesus just had this tremendous ability, uh, miraculous insight that when they go into the city, there will happen to be a man with a water jar. And that if they follow him, he will happen to take them to the right place. And if they go in there and just say these words with that now carry Jesus' authority, then the owner of that place will happen to have a room prepared for them and happily let them do it. The other approach is that Jesus arranged this ahead of time. And <clears throat> the same thing about the, the entry into Jerusalem story. Either Jesus just really knew they'd find a cult and and he just knew that if he said, if they say to the people watching the cult, the Lord needs it, they'd let them have it. Um, or Jesus had made arrangements and those people standing there watching the cult, they're waiting for the password. <laughs> they know it's coming. Um, I mean, there's a part of us that, that really wants Jesus to have all of this uh, foresight and insight and, you know, miraculous ability to kind of tell odd things that are getting ready to happen. Um, and that's admirable, and it kind of feeds into the way many of us have been taught to think about Jesus as just this um, totally miraculous figure. And that's fine. But I want to suggest that another way of thinking about Jesus is somebody who does his homework, and he plans, and he makes he's organized. He, 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 he is very much orchestrating these events. 
he orchestrates a public event in the 11th chapter. And whether it's a parody or just the best peasant uh, parade you can put together, um, he orchestrates that and it's public and a crowd is all into it. And here he's orchestrating a private event where he's just gonna gather with his disciples and he's gonna break the bread for the cup uh, and, and let them know what's coming. Um, so you see those two different ways of kind of approaching that story. Um, I, I tend towards the second one, obviously. All right, any questions about the preparation part and its parallel language with the preparation for the entry? Yes, Jerry. Well, you know, that's interesting, but this isn't Jesus' backyard. This is the first time he's been to Jerusalem. So that he has an organization set up ahead of time that's there that can get him fed, to get horses to set up whatever. Take some organization. Isn't it sort of interesting? There's nothing said about him sending Peter on ahead to, with instructions on getting together. There, there's no sort of story uh, of what it would take, which would seem to be interesting reporting. If I'm Mark and I'm reporting on what's happened, that would be an interesting part of it. Yeah. Mark could easily have settled this question of yeah. what's going on here by saying, uh, and you know, while they were still in Galilee and Jesus sent so-and-so ahead to take care of matters, um, Mark doesn't say that. Um, so maybe that's just 21st century skepticism kicking in and saying, ah, these things were planned. I don't know. Um, but you're right. Mark just gives us the raw story. Jesus tells two people to go to do this and behold, there it is. Um, and, and, and that's why I have to hold it out to you. Maybe it's just really a powerful, amazing thing that Jesus is able to do that you can't, and neither can I. Um, or maybe it's something we can do. Hard to say. Well, we're told uh, repeatedly in the Bible of the spiritual part of him and the humanist. And being human is what something somebody would do. They would plan ahead. They get the preparations and that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. And 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 boy, it's really hard to find a, a great language to express what you're talking about there, Shirley. Um, when when the church of uh, when the church at in Chalcedon gave us the right way to talk about Jesus. They said Jesus is fully human and fully divine. Not part human, part divine. Fully human, fully divine. Hard to know how to even say that. I mean, that's a 200% person. Not, I, I don't even know how to think about that. Um, so, but there are moments when Jesus does things that sure seem like that's his divinity talking. And then at other times, boy, that's his humanity talking. It, it's really hard. Um, and uh, I think we have a fair number of folks, probably in our congregation, who are much more comfortable with, with the humanity of Christ than with, with the divinity of Christ claim. And we have others who for whom the divinity of Christ is incredibly what makes Jesus different and not just another hero. Um, and, and, you know, I think the church, I, I in the end, we'll call it a mystery because I, I don't think the church has ever found a way of naming that fullness of Christ uh, in a way that immediately convincing to everybody who hears it. But as we read through this story, that's something to keep in mind um, because we're going to see some very difficult human struggle here in just a couple of verses. <laughs> and it would be, if, if, if it's the sense that when Jesus is sending these disciples, it's because he's got all of this insight of what's going to happen in the future and he's really cool with that and, you know, um, 
he's that miraculous. It's hard to reconcile that with the Jesus who's going to be praying in the garden. So Mark is giving us a really, really full and and challenging picture, I think. But, but let's get there in, in good time. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. Okay, so we prepared for the meal. Um, what I wanted you to see was there are two ways of looking at that and that the preparation in chapter 14 for the meal are very similar to the way Jesus prepared for the parade in chapter 11. The next section then is verses 17 through 25. And uh, there are two things happening here. Number one is they're having a meal, which we know now as the last supper and uh, your bible probably even has the subtitle the institution of the last supper um let me let me let me pause real quickly to say why we use that language about the last supper and it's because jesus says do this in remembrance as often as you do so in the meal itself Jesus is setting a pattern for his followers to reenact in the future. That's intentional in the meal itself. That's why we call it the institution of the path of, and what's of, of the Lord's Supper. And what's interesting is the original Passover, the same thing happened. They made, uh, they made the unleavened bread because they were getting ready to leave Egypt in a hurry. And and unleavened bread is bread on the go. You don't have to wait for it to rise, right? You, you, you got it, and then you can cook it and eat it, and you, you're done with it, that kind of thing. Unleavened bread, even in the middle of that very dangerous episode of these slaves getting ready to have a window of opportunity to leave Egypt, which that window is going to close very quickly, and next thing you know, Pharaoh is going to send the army after them to bring them back as he changed his mind. Um, even in the peril of that moment, it says right there, and every year you'll do this. <laughs> you'll bake this bread and you'll remember when you were slaves in Egypt. So even then, uh, in that event, it was, it was both an event and setting the course for rep rep repetitious remembering. And that's what's happening here why we call it the institution of the Lord's Supper. Um, Jesus isn't just eating with them, Je isn't just having Passover with them. He's giving them a, a, a new way of embracing this meal in the future. Uh, so a couple of things happen. First of all, um, in verse 18, in verse 18, it, it notes that they have already begun to eat. Okay, I just want you to note that. Um, it's not like all the chatter happens and then they eat. There, this is in the process of a meal. It sure looks like it's a Passover meal. Whether their Passover meal had all the different steps of a Jewish Passover meal now or not, I don't know. If so, this lasted three hours <laughs> because those meals can last forever. You know, you walk through every bit of it and they tell you the story and the kids ask questions and they give me it. Um, so, uh, but the meal is ongoing starts in verse 18 um, and and it seems that the process of the meal ends in verse 26 with this really interesting phrase and when they had sung a hymn they left some bibles say the hymn uh, as if there's a particular standard hymn there's no definite article so when they had sung a hymn they left and that the word for singing a hymn is actually um, a verbal form of the word hymn. So when they had hymned, when they had hymnized, I don't know how you turn the word hymn into a verb, uh, but that's what this is in Greek. And and it's transliterated. I mean, the verb is actually um, humneo, from which we get the, the root of which becomes nominally hymn, and the verb is singing a hymn. So this is the meal, starts in verse 18, officially ends in verse 26 with a hymn. Um, and during that meal, a couple of things happen. Two things, really. 
Number one is in verses 17 through 21, Jesus will predict that he'll be betrayed. Um, one of the things you want to think about in this part of the story and in what follows is whether Judas was just a bad egg who did a bad thing. And, you know, somehow God swallowed it up into something victorious in the end. Or whether Judas was destined to do what he did. Is Judas a cad or is he a tool? <laughs> is he a cog? A cad or a cog? I'll use those words. Um, is, is he simply doing what needed to be done and God is God is ultimately the one doing this? Or is he just a bad egg, you know, and and wants money or or is impatient, doesn't want Jesus to ride on a donkey, wants Jesus to get on a steed and 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 drive these Romans out, get a real kingdom going here, not this lovey dovey stuff. You know, it's hard to say. It's hard to say with Judas. And I don't think the gospel writers necessarily agree on it. Sometimes um, Judas is mentioned one time earlier in Mark's gospel. And that's when in chapter five, I think it is, Jesus calls the 12 and Mark names them all. And the very last one is Judas, comma, who betrayed him. So Judas is identified from the get-go right there. Um, but it doesn't say anything about the motive. It just said that's who Ju this Judas is. Because there are other, other Judases in the story. Um, he's, he's called Judas Iscariot. And there's just not really much agreement among biblical scholars what this Iscariot means. It could mean that he's from the town called Cariel, uh, which would actually be a Judean town. So he'd be the southernmost of all of the apostles. It could be uh, a reference to the word for, for, for night, because there was a Sicario group that would kind of hold knives in hiding and stab Roman soldiers in the back and then run away with the crowd and get away with it. Um, and so in some respects, it, it became kind of popular for a while to imagine that that Judas, before becoming a disciple, was actually one of these zealots that was bent on trying to take back the empire by force. And the way you do that is you sneak up and just kill the Roman soldiers one by one and hope you can run away and get away with it. Um, it's all speculation built on the fact that we're not really sure what Iscariot means, but he described as Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Um, there's another Judas mentioned in uh, the sixth, sixth chapter, I think it is. Um, and Jesus, Jesus had a brother named Judas. So you got to distinguish one Judas from another. It's a fairly common name. You know, there's a book called Jude in the Bible. That's another Judas there. Um, Judas Maccabees was a Judas. It was a very popular name, especially after the Maccabean Revolution. So the identification comes in the fifth chapter when all the 12 are named and he's lame last, Judas Iscariot, comma, who betrayed him. Um, and now we have Judas um, who's in the meal. He hasn't, he hasn't sneaked out yet. He's in the meal. And um, Jesus predicts that one of them will betray him. Um, I want to look at that for just a second. Um, so he says, one of you will betray me. And they began looking at each other saying, is it I? <laughs> right? Um, it's hard to know exactly whether... In some of the Gospels, the, the nuances of the verb tense and and so forth seem to make it, it's not me, is it? 
And in others, it's more like, is it me? Uh, there's a whole big difference between those two questions, right? Um, but in the end, all 12 of them, if I'm reading this correctly, um, all 12 of them think they're not the one. So Jesus says in verse 20, um, it's one of the 12 who's dipping uh, bread into the bowl with me. Um, later, when Jesus tells Peter that he'll deny him, uh, Jesus said, all of you will become deserted. And Peter said, I won't. And Jesus said, oh, yeah, you will. By the time you caught first twice, you'll deny me three times. Um, and then verse 31, but Peter said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. To this point, Judas is still in the room. And he's one of the people saying, it's not me. So it's kind of you know, kind of hard to know what, where Judas's heart is here. It, it's fun to speculate. And, easy to dislike him for any number of reasons. Um, notice that when Jesus says, uh, one of you will betray me, um, one who is eating with me, they began to be distressed and say, surely not I. And he said to them as one of the 12 who's dipping bread into the bowl with me. And then Jesus says, for the son of man goes as it is written of him. That's where you want to ask. Is it destined that one of them has to betray him rather than simply a choice from a from bad intentions or a misunderstanding? Did Judas have to do what Judas did? And if so, why do we hate him so much? <laughs> was was he playing the role that God gave him? Or did Jesus just know that one of them was going to cop up eventually? And um but, but Jesus doesn't let Judas off the hook by saying, well, it was fated. It was God's will. Because he follows by saying, but woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. And that's probably the worst curse anyone could ever have. Curse the day I was born. Would that I had died on the table than to have this life. So it's, it's so ambiguous, right? Judas is doing what has to be done so that the scriptures can be fulfilled. Uh, but but it should have been better off if he's never been. Say, what kind of religion would we have today if he hadn't done it? There's that. You know, I they would have killed Jesus sooner or later. He wouldn't have got by, <laughs> especially after chapter 12. Um, but yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, for our sake, Judas plays a necessary role, and um, and for Jesus' sake, Judas is playing a necessary role. Um, but that doesn't let him off the hook. So I think that raises great question with regard to destiny and freedom. I don't think they're polar opposites. I don't think you're either living some kind of destiny or you're making all your free choices. I think there are times you can be destined towards something and still quite responsible for what you're doing. Um, think about that. Instead of destiny, which sounds like a philosophical term, think about your genetic coding. Think about that. You have been genetically disposed towards certain ways of being, certain ways of thinking, certain ways of acting and feeling. And you did not ask for it, you just got it. And that's what the word destiny is trying to name. Those things you don't ask for, you just are you're given it to, it's given to you to be this way. And yet you also have free will and you make decisions. And while you may be destined you know, to be, uh, never a morning person that doesn't mean you get to be grouchy right you're making <laughs> choice right we we live in in, in that con that that interplay between destiny and freedom 
and you certainly does. Yes, ma'am. Also, generational trauma, which is not the same just as genetic. No. Right. The, the things that we come to from, from our parents and they got from the ones that came before them and it's passed down and sometimes it's so subtly, but yep. but still powerfully. It is. And 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 sometimes you'll Very see true. somebody mm -hmm. who's acting out on it and you want to be angry with them, but you almost feel sorry for them because they just truly they don't know how else to act, right? Yeah. I, I, I think there's real psychological insight here. But we have to move on because we have a lot more to cover. Okay. So two parts of the meal. One is the prediction of the betrayal. Uh the other is the bread and wine part that we read all the time, right? In chapter six and chapter eight, when Jesus feeds the five thousand and then later feeds the four thousand. In both cases, he takes the bread and blesses it and breaks it. This was a very Jesus we had that started before the Last Supper. That's what Jesus does. All right. Um, in chapter 10, Jesus mentions um, Jesus had just told the disciples for the third time that he's going to go to Jerusalem and die. And James and John come to him and ask to be seated on his right hand and his left hand when the kingdom comes. And Jesus says, you don't really know what you're asking. Are you able to drink from the cup that I must drink? And they say, yeah. He said, well, you will drink it, but you're not going to like it. Um, <laughs> and um, so so the, the whole notion of breaking, blessing bread and breaking it and drinking from the cup as a symbol of death, uh, they're already laid into the story before we get to this last meal. It's kind of an interesting thing. Hang on to that question, Jerry, so, so I can trot through the other things, but, but please don't forget. Okay. Um, verses 26 through 31. We looked at them just a moment ago. Um, Jesus says, all of you will desert me. And he, he cites Zechariah chapter, chapter 13. Just a small portion of it. Let me read you a little larger portion. It says, awake, O sword, against my shepherd." Against the man who is my associate, says the Lord of hosts. Talk about parody and sarcastic language. Um, Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. And the whole land, says the Lord, two thirds shall be cut off and perish. One third shall be left alive. So it sounds horrible. And he said, I will put this third into the fire, refine them as one refined silver, test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. And I will say, they are my people, and they will say, this is my God. So this whole thing about striking the shepherd and the sheep scattering, this, this is a well-known proverbial insight, even from the prophetic time, um, uh, about what happens when the leader is destroyed. And that's what Jesus cites as a way of telling the twelve. You're going to abandon. Okay. Uh, and, and, and they all say they won't. And Simon Peter declares he really, really won't. And Jesus says you will. Okay. All right. The next scene then in verses 32 to 42. This is where I think it gets terribly interesting. Okay. Jesus is in the, um, this is where he goes to the garden to pray. And this prayer is really some raw Christology. It, it's a very raw look at Jesus. Uh, a genuine, honest struggle between what Jesus wills and what God wills. Notice how Jesus says, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. That's an interesting prayer. A couple of chapters earlier, Jesus had an argument with some folks and said, why do you say if it's possible? With God, think all things are possible. And in fact, Jesus begins his prayer by saying, God, with you, all things are possible. It's not a question of can God. It's a question of will God. That's what Jesus is struggling with in this prayer. Um, 
So, so the Jesus that knows there's going to be a man carrying a water jar when they get to the town and all, a Jesus that that divine you would expect to come into this garden and say, God, it, this is going to be the tough part, but I'm ready for it. Um, give me the strength and just kind of walk. But this is not that prayer. This prayer is like, wow, if there are any other way we can accomplish this, let's go that way. But if not, Jesus does get to where he says, nevertheless, not my will, but your will. But it's the last word, not the first word of this prayer. Initially, this prayer is a struggle. Karl Barth says at the center of this prayer is a riddle. You're not going to like this. Okay. At the center of this prayer is a riddle. Because what Satan wants and what Jesus' enemies want is the same thing as what God wants. For Jesus to die. It's not what Jesus wants. It's what he's willing to do. It's not what he wants. Um, what God wants is the same thing as what Jesus is enemy in. I don't know where Bart is reading Satan into the story, but what Satan wants. Same thing as what God wants. Um, I will tell you the way that that has comforted me. Surprisingly is when I am facing a situation and I cannot see any redemptive arc to it whatsoever. And I'm thinking of Jesus here, trusting that even though it looks like the devil is going to win, <laughs> the enemies are going to win, I am going to lose. And I can't see anything good about this. And nonetheless, Somehow, God is going to do something out of it. That's what resurrection means. God can make new life out of death. If I, if I believed that in every situation, I would be able to face every situation with equanimity and, and, and trust. Um, but I'm more like, you know, Jesus at the end of his wits here in some respects, you know, saying, oh, God, no, 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 no. Okay. If you must. <laughs> Sometimes I don't even get to that. I'm more like the disciples and I've already left the building. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so they're out to destroy the one sent from God and in their success, God's will is done. Meanwhile, while Jesus is praying, this heart-rendering prayer that we can't read it without Hearing, were you there? You know, in the back of our mind. The disciples are sleeping. What does that say about them? What does that say about the church? Right there. Can you imagine all the crises going on, the real crises in the world, and how the church is over here worries about the oil or, you know, and, you know, fighting over the color of the carpet. <laughs> um, I, I think the church often ends up sleeping when a struggle or the will of God in the midst of tragedy is ongoing. I, I think the disciples are horribly depicted here. And I think Mark has little to no respect for them. They they don't come they don't come across well. Um okay, real quickly, uh in the next text, verses 43 through 52, I like to think of it as discipleship as kiss and run. Um Look at all the various ways that people live into this story. The crowd comes from the chief priests, scribes, and elders with cudgels and swords. Judas betrays Jesus by kissing him. So what might be at work here is it's dark. You got a group of Galilean men, the Judean, or if they have some Roman soldiers with them, they can't tell one Galilean from another, especially in the dark. And... Um, Judas knows which one is Jesus. And so by kissing Jesus, he's identifying. That may be part of what's going on here. Someone has to identify which of these people we're arresting here. Um, one of the disciples, not named, elsewhere we're told it's Peter, but not named, 
grabs a sword and cuts off the ear of the chief priest's servant. Um, all the disciples desert and flee. And then you have this curious young man who's standing there wearing nothing but a linen cloth. And they try to grab him and he runs away, leaving the cloth in their hands. And he runs away naked. This mysterious naked man. I have no idea who he is or what to make of this. Some people say it's Mark. Some people say it's the same young man who shows up wearing a bright cloth at the tomb. Who's never actually called her an angel. Just a young man in a, the same word, uh, which is, just means young man uh, in both stories. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I think it's mysterious cameo appearance of somebody that I don't know. Um, but all of that happens. And notice that in the middle of all of that, Jesus says, um, you came to arrest me. I, I've been I've been publicly speaking all the time, yet you come with swords and, and cudgels as if I'm a thief. And then Jesus says, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. Once again, this is horrible. It's underhanded. It's unnecessary. It's sneaky. They're doing it at night manifestly because they're afraid of the crowd, that they won't do it in the light. They can only do it under the shadow of the darkness. And even while Jesus calls that out as terrible misbehavior, he also says, let the scriptures be fulfilled. So Jesus is speaking of both their free acts and the destiny of that moment. Um, what, what scriptures? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Jesus will repeatedly throughout all this refer to himself as a son of man. Mm -hmm. And that's a phrase that comes up a few times in the Old Testament, sometimes in the prophets and sometimes in the Psalms. And sometimes, particularly in the last half of Daniel, and the Son of Man is, a, is there are really two features that kind of go with that phrase. It's a suffering servant. So think of Psalm 22, which Jesus quotes on the cross. Um, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's from that psalm. Um, so so that, that image of the, the Son of Man as a suffering servant, and in Daniel chapter 7 through 12, the Son of Man is the eschatological, the, 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 the one that comes in the clouds uh, to bring in the new ring. Um, so it's a working term, Son of Man, and... Um, it seems that when Jesus is accepting this fate as biblical, he's accepting the fate of the Son of Man as a, um, who, one who sacrificed. Go read Psalm 22 um, and, and the other Isaiah 42, I think it is, where he, he um, you know, Mark, I should know this thing, um, where where he's suffering and he doesn't say anything. Uh, that, that's quoted elsewhere. Um, like a lamb led before the slaughter. That's the son of man. Too. Thanks for that question. All right. Um, so the irony in the prayer in the garden, I don't want to do this, it's terrible. Nonetheless, your will be done, is going on here at the arrest. They're doing a bad thing and a sneaky thing. A stealthy thing. Nonetheless, they're fulfilling scripture. And that's going on with Judas, who's fulfilling scripture. Um, all right. Then uh, you have the trial where Jesus is accused of blasphemy. They, I, we don't have a lot of time left. So let me just say in verses 53 through 65, um, the, the trial, it's a kangaroo court in many ways. You know, they, they try to have witnesses. They can't really find witnesses that say Jesus has done anything heretical. Um, but they do produce some false witnesses, and their stories don't match. <laughs> so this is a kangaroo court. And um, and finally, you know, they, 
they say Jesus' own words are are what accuses him. Um, Jesus is asked, are you the son of man? Are you the son of God? Are you the coming one? And his answer is, I am. Borg and Crossan argue that ego, a me, um, could be translated, am I? It could be a question um, where Jesus simply evades answering that question, or else he just lives into it. Um, Jesus makes reference in his trial to Daniel chapter 7, identifying himself as the Son of Man, because he says, you'll see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. That's, um, that's in verse 62 of Mark's 14th chapter. Um, that's a common allusion to the salvation that comes. Um, we'll, we'll have more to think about that, more time to think about that on a different occasion. Um, in terms of the charge of blasphemy, this is not the first time Jesus has been charged with blasphemy. First time happened in chapter two, when he looked at a man laying on a pallet who was paralyzed and said, your sins are forgiven. And immediately the leaders of the, um, the religious leaders start questioning, how can he forgive? This is blasphemy. And that's when Jesus said, is he do to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? Get up and walk. And the guy got up and walked. Um, so this is not the first time he's been accused of blasphemy, but that's the charge here. Um, I, I wrote a really important comment here. I want to read it to you, okay? Um, <laughs> you can tell me later if I really was important. That now the irony of the prayer in the garden and the irony in the arrest are presented to the reader. What the Sanhedrin interpret as blasphemy, that Jesus is claiming to be a son of God, son of man, what they are interpreting as blasphemy is precisely what Mark's audience is called to believe. So now we have our own irony here, where the religious leaders say, this is blasphemy, and we're supposed to look at that and say, it's what I believe. Um, so, for Mark's readers, for Mark's readers, whether they're Gentile Christians or Jewish Christians, they have to embrace but has officially been called blasphemy in order to follow Jesus. That's 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 something we don't think about at all after the you know the years of Christendom that we've been part of. Um, and then verses sixty six through seventy two are when Peter denies Jesus three times. Um, notice in verse fifty four. We had been told ahead of time, Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and was sitting with the guard, warming himself at the fire. Peter sitting on the wrong team's bench. Right? He's with the guard. They, they just arrested you. And now they're waiting outside for all the official stuff to happen, warming themselves, and Peter sitting with them. That's when all of these conversations take place. The first denial is to a servant of the high priest who looks at Peter and says, you were with him. And um, look at what he says. I do not know or understand what you're talking about. Uh, this is the first pope of the church. We're all in deep trouble. Right? Um, this, this, is, this is utter denial of discipleship. The second, and, and, and after that, the top grows for the first time. The second denial happens when that same young girl says to some of the other bystanders, this man is one of them. And then we're just told by the narrator, again, he denied. And then the third time is when one of the bystanders said, of course you're one of them, because you're a Galilean. Um, and Peter began to curse and swore an oath, saying, I do not know this man we're talking about. Then the cock crows for the second time. And that's when Peter leaves and um, remember Jesus' words, broke down and wept. That's um, 
I think Mark had a very low esteem for Peter and the other disciples, particularly in this moment. But at the same time, Mark will repeatedly place this moment into the destiny of what needs to happen for the scripture to be fulfilled. So that's that's a run through a very complicated thing. And I um I'm going to just stop right there. Thank you. I'm first I'm going to look and see what's in the chat here from we got Betty and Bill and Beryl. Anybody with the name that starts with B is joining us. <laughs> um Bill's noting that that the difficulty of that phrase, it would have been better for that one not to be born. Um, and he's questioning whether there's any salvation possible for Judas. And I'm not going to answer that. Um, yeah, so um, Beryl is, is saying that in some respects you could be reading Jesus as foretelling throughout the arrest the meal and the arrest and so forth in the same way that he might have been foretelling when he arranged the meal in the first place, arranged the donkey in the first place. Um, Mark, as a narrator, and we as readers, we're looking back, right? And so we, we've read this book before. <laughs> this isn't our first radio here. And um, Mark's audience probably had heard many of these stories. So there's not that drama of in the moment how in the world did that happen so much for us as it might have been for somebody in the story? Um, and Beryl asked the same question you asked, to what scripture exactly is Jesus referring? And um, there aren't a lot that are specifically quoted here. You get the impression sometimes maybe Mark um, is not terribly familiar with the Old Testament, uh, at least many parts of it. Uh, Zechariah chapter 9 is cited by the narrator. Daniel chapter 7 is cited by Jesus. Remember when Daniel was written, the people of Israel were living under another empire. And uh, the, the Seleucid, um, Seleucid uh, general Antiochus Epiphanes had gone into the the holy place and offered a sacrifice of a pig to Zeus on the altar. And so it blasphemed the altar. And this was this was about the time just before the Maccabean revolution. So um the, the last half of Daniel probably comes from that era when the people of Israel were living under another empire looking for release, just like in Jesus' time, they're living under the Roman Empire, looking for release. So it's really interesting that he would be citing the second half of Dean. Um, okay, I do need to stop because I can tell Sue Ann's out there getting ready to come in and do a head count, <laughs> as she is wont to do. And uh, so let me thank all of you who have joined us online, and thank you all in the room. And I have to stop the recording. Questions?